Thank you, Cody. Um, let's give it up for Cody for doing some uh, announcements for us. I think he's doing an awesome job. Uh, so it's funny, this time last week when I got up um, and uh, said good morning to you, I said, well, it's going to rain for the next week. Uh, and it rained for the next week. Is it did stop raining out there this morning? I know when I came in, it was raining. It's just been crazy. So um, get a little bit of an understanding of what Noah felt like, right? Uh, I want to want to do a few things this morning. Tell you a few things. One, I'm going to remove the pulpit again. I just found that last week I could connect a little bit better with you when I was sitting on the stool and just didn't have anything in front of me. So I'm going to talk like this. Just kind of talk like we are family. I love what Daniel said that we're just in a living room together. We call this the table. The reason we call it the table is because we want to imagine all of our, our, our family sitting around the table and having a conversation every week and sharing in communion. So I might stand up when I start really preaching and sweating, um, but, uh, but for right now, I want to, I'm going to just hang out. So if you've, uh, if you've been with us, we've been in a series on the book of Joshua, and we kind of followed Joshua through this journey as he goes into the promised land, Moses commissions him, and um, he takes the Israelites into the place that God uh, had really designated for the people of Israel to go, a land flowing with milk and honey. And we're going to come to Joshua chapter 14 today. And so if you have your Bibles, that may be a place that you want to turn is Joshua <coughs> chapter 14. As you do that, I want to ask you a question, kind of an odd question. Um, actually, one that uh, I, I was kind of an odd starter to a sermon. I, 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 want, to, I want to know this. Um, does anybody here know someone named Caleb? Anybody named Caleb? Now, you might be here today and you might have named your child Caleb or um, you may have a, a friend named Caleb or an Uncle Caleb. Um, the name Caleb is a really, really powerful name. In fact, the name Caleb, when you say it, should come with tons of authority because the name Caleb means faithful. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew word for dog. And if you look in the Old Testament, the dog was actually a faithful uh, in Hebrew culture, the dog was actually a faithful animal. It was an animal that was always by your side. Anybody here a dog lover? I'm a dog lover. Aren't your dogs always there? Anybody here love cats? Don't put your hand up. I don't want to know. Cats are never there. They're never faithful. They do their own thing. So when you think about the name Caleb, I want you to think about faithful. I want you to think about companion. I want you to think about someone who's strong and someone who God commissioned um, to, uh, to carry the name of faith. We're introduced to him uh, in the Bible in the book of Numbers. And he's somebody in the Old Testament who we find out is a companion of Moses and Joshua. And so we're going to talk about Caleb today. And if you're here and you happen to be named Caleb, well, you're going to feel really, really special by the end of the sermon today. Um, once again, the name Caleb means faith. And the question I want to put before you this morning as we talk is how much faith do you have in God? So how much faith do you have that God is who God says he is? Now, what is faith? Well, the Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So it just means that you believe that God is who God says he is when you can't even see God. My wife has a great faith. In fact, her faith is a whole lot greater than mine. When we talked about tithing last week, I struggle with tithing. I'll be honest, I'll write the check and I wish I could just go, man, this is just the easiest thing in the world. But sometimes I struggle, I'm like, oh, here comes God, I know I need to give this to you. My wife's just like, kabam. It's done. Um, when it comes to the fear of, of sickness or, 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 or death, I wish I could tell you I'm like, man, I'm not scared. But I have anxiety about death sometimes. My wife, she's like, I'm good. If I die, he can take me. If I get sick, so be it. God is God. She has a deep, genuine faith. Now, I don't know where you fall in that spectrum. But the Bible says that faith is crucial to who we are as believers. Um, the Bible tells us that it's through grace, by faith, that we are saved. It's through grace, by faith, that we are saved. It says, whatever we ask for in faith, we will receive. 
So if we ask, believing we'll receive it, the Bible says that we will. The Bible tells us that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Um, the Bible says if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, a mustard seed, this is tiny, 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 I did a sermon on that one time. If we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. So once again, how much faith do you have? Well, the Bible tells us that Caleb had this great, immense faith. We're introduced to him in the book of Numbers. And I don't know how many of you remember this story, but Moses is called to enter the promised land. And God says to Moses, he says, I want you to choose a man from each of the tribes of Israel to go into the promised land and to spy it out and to see what it looks like. And so we know that Moses chooses one person from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you all remember that? He chooses one man from each of the 12 tribes. And, and he ends up, um, one of those guys is Joshua. And one of those guys is Caleb. And so all of these spies go into the land. There's 12 of them. They go into the land. They check it out. They find that it's a land that's fruitful. It's flowing with milk and honey. But here's the bad thing. It's inhabited by giants. Do y'all remember that part of the story? They're like, the land is filled with milk and honey. It's great. But the giants there. I want to read this to you. It's Numbers 13, verses 27 through 29. This is the, what the spies say. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We have even seen descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Now, listen, we skip ahead a few verses. Here's what it said. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living there. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Do y'all remember the Nephilim? I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and everybody's like, who's the Nephilim? Anybody ever met, have anybody just heard of them? Do you recognize them in the Bible? Hands? Anybody know? Nobody knows who the Nephilim We got one hand in the back that knows who the Nephilim are. Okay? It'd be a cool name to name your band. I think it'd be like Nephilim, or it'd be a name like maybe your next child, Nephilim. I, I, I'm playing, but if we go back to the book of Genesis, um, and we look at Genesis 1 through 4, and you can check this out yourself. It's Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. We find that the, that the Nephilim, were, were the offspring of the sons of God who were demons and the daughters of men. So the Bible actually says that the demons came to earth. Remember, one-third of the angels <coughs> rebelled against God. They were sent down to earth. And it says that those demons came together with women, and they had children. And they had these giants called the Nephilim. And, and so... Some people believe that Goliath was a Nephilim. And how tall was Goliath? Anybody remember? The Bible tells us how tall he was. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. Anybody ever seen Andre the Giant wrestle? I always think of Goliath. I don't know. Um, but some people say that Goliath was a descendant of the Nephilim. So what I'm telling you is that they go to the promised land, all 12 of these spies, Joshua and Caleb included, and it's a land filled with Goliaths. And they come back and they go, there is no way that we're going to be able to do this. They do not have the what? The faith. They go, God, we can't do it. We cannot do it. I mean, they go, say to Moses, Moses, we can't do it. There's no way we're going to a land filled with giants. And then they mention all these other people, like the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and whatever else. So listen, though. Listen, this is what the 12 spies say. Here's what Caleb says. Faithful Caleb. The name Caleb means faith. It says in Numbers 13.30, Caleb silenced the people before Moses. He silenced the people. In other words, he said, everybody get quiet. He probably said, shut up. I don't know if they could say that in front of God back then, but he probably said, shut up. Everybody shut up. Listen. And he says, 
We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Now, Joshua, we also know, believed they could do it. But Caleb says, we can certainly do it. So 10 out of the 12 spies go, not going to the land. Caleb says, we've got this. Now, here's my question. How many of you in here today would consider yourself to be a Caleb? You're like, I don't care what it is. If God tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. If God is with me, I will not fail. How many Caleb's do we have? Well, I thought more people would be like, well, that's kind of me, but nobody. I mean, we've got no cables. We've got to work on this. That's why I have the sermon. <laughs> but how many cables? Now, um, one of the questions we may want to post ourselves is, are we a Caleb church? Are we a Caleb church, or are we the other ten spies? Because when God calls us to do something like a doctrinity, like a doctrine, like a doctrinity, like a doctrinity, do we have the faith that we can do this? Are we taking initiative when God says do it? Are we willing to do it and stand in faith? Do we believe in him and do we trust him? Do we trust in ourselves or do we trust in God? Now, here's a question that I, that I want you to write down if you're a note taker. Because this is a really, really important question that I come back to constantly. Here it is right here. Are we measuring our obstacles against our own strength? Or against God's strength. So when you look at the problems in your life, are you going, okay, this is what God's called me to. Here's who I am as Justin, the broken individual. Here's what he wants me to do. And I go, can't do it. Rather than going, here's the obstacle. Here's Justin, a believer and follower of God. God who called me, God who gives me the ability, God who says I have no limitations with him, God who says we can do all things through him who strengthens me, through Christ, do I put myself up against the obstacle? Because you can't stand against the obstacles that God calls you to if you don't stand in God. If God goes climb the mountain and you go, I'll try to do it in my own strength, you can't do it. But if God says climb it and climb it in me and trust in me, that's the difference. That's who Caleb was. Caleb goes, man, I don't care how big the mountain is. I don't care the hill country. I don't care about the giants. I can do it. Now listen, how does history go? So what happens? What happens after the, ten spy, or the 12 spies come back? The 10 of them scream bloody murder that we can't do this. Caleb and Joshua say we can. What happens? Anybody remember? God goes, you know what? See, the ten spies, they talk to the people and they go, we can't do it. And the people go, oh my gosh, we can't do it, do it because our ten leaders are screaming we can't do it. Here's what happens. They don't do it. You know what God does? God says, because of your lack of faith, you're going to wander. And you're going to wander for 40 years. You're just going to wander. And you know, what he does? you know what happens in the 40 years? The whole generation of unbelievers dies out. So everybody, the only two people who are left at the end of, of, of the at the end of the forty years, the only two people who are at least twenty years or older at the time of the of, of this decision are Caleb and Joshua. So the Israelites wander for forty years, and then they get done wandering, and we skip ahead and we come to Joshua fourteen. And you know what happens after forty years of wandering? We pick back up with the story, and we pick back up with Caleb. Caleb is now 85 years old. He was 45 years old when he was saying all the things we read earlier. He's now 85. Now, get this. 85 years old. Caleb's been wandering. He's following Joshua. Joshua's the leader. All the people have been grumbling. He, he, their kids have been raised in this mess. They don't know where they're going. They've been hungry. They've been eating manna. Horrible experience. Caleb gets done, and here's what he says in Joshua 14, 10 through 12. Listen. It says, Now then... Just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. He's 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle 
as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself, you yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But listen, listen, listen. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Dude's 85 years old. No offense if you're in here and you're 85. Um, especially if you're named Caleb in 85. But this guy's tough. He says, I can do it. That's Caleb. Caleb is the same at 40 that he is, 45 that he is at 85. With the Lord's help, you can do it. See, you can't do it by yourself. You can only do it with him. I was preparing for this message this week, and I was thinking about stories of journeys of faith. Um, and one of the things I want to do with our service, and I'm trying to make this turn, if you've noticed, is that it's really important to me that we have people come up and give testimony. Maybe we have somebody do that every week. Because you are the people of God. And, and you preach a whole lot better than me. I found that out. Whenever I bring somebody up here, everybody's like, man, they did a great job. Nobody tells me just a good sermon. They're just like, they're awesome. I'm like, that's, that's what we want. Because it's about you. You're the congregation, not me. I'm a part of it. And so I was thinking about somebody that could share a journey of faith. And, um, and so I'm going to invite a couple up here who's going through a struggle, yet I've witnessed them do it with extreme faith and extreme trust in God. And if you know them... Um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I want to invite forward um, Mitzi McCall and her husband, Mike. If you guys would come up. Y'all can give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thing Mitzi's going through because I think she is. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just let you talk, Missy, share a little bit about about where you are in life right now. Okay. Yes, yeah, good. Okay. My name is Mitzi McCall, and I have cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma does not define me, but being a child of God does define me. Pain, sickness, illness, death, a whole lot of problems happen daily. Well, this is earth. This is not heaven. You can't prepare yourself for these dark times, but you can do as Paul instructed. Let your roots, um, as Paul instructed, uh, Colossians 2, 17. Do we have that? We got you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let your roots grow down into him and your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Faith is not something you see. It's a choice to trust God. From the start of my diagnosis in September of 2017, God has held my hand during this journey. In October of last year, 2018, Mike and I got the, the news from the doctor that I had two weeks to live. Well, like anything else, what's going through your mind? Two weeks, how do I get everything together in two weeks? But what came out my mouth to the doctor was, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and, and truly that was God speaking. God had my back on that. Then again in December, I started into renal failure twice. Each time, God said to me, I'll fix this. Now my journey is not easy, as this cancer has no human cure. But I am letting God do the driving, and I'm enjoying each day. Everybody can recite Jeremiah 29:11. But let's take it a little further to verse, to verse 12 and 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, 
plans to prosper and not harm you, plans to give you hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I guess what I'd like to say to everybody is seek his, faith, um, seek his face, have faith in him, and then you can find all the joy you can imagine. They're married. <laughs> no, um, but, uh, you know, I personally have gotten to witness these two, and I just want to say it's a personal testimony to witness the two of them going through this with the strength of the Lord and leaning into God. And, and I know it's not perfect. I, I know there's probably times where you're at home and you go, man, you know, we're just throwing my hands up, frustrated, and maybe even frustrated with God, you know. But um, at the end of the day, I think both of you have given Him glory. We had a healing service. Um, for Mitzi, she was open to that. We had, I don't know, 40, like 40 something people in there, just lines there to pray over her. And um, and I, I've just seen how they've run to God and not from God. And so to sit and put Mitzi on public display, it's just, this is just testimony. Um, I just want you to hear from them. And it's real and it's raw. And it takes courage to get up in front of your congregation and to share. And I, and I commend them for, for doing it when the preacher calls and says, Will you, will you just get up and just share? Um, it takes a lot of courage. And Mike, you want to, you should say something, Mike. What do you do? Uh, just uh, love every day. Amen. Because you never don't know what the boss can free. <laughs> You know, during all this, uh, God has really been by our sides, and we have been so, so blessed. And, you know, the saying, God is good all the time, and God is truly good all the time, and he has truly blessed Mike and I. This, this illness I have has actually brought both of us closer to God. Um, I trusted him before, but I trust him even more now. And I vision God at my heaven in my right hand, and Mike's got my left hand over there. He keeps me at home. So, um, let's. I wanted to say one other thing while you guys are up here, and just, just give a, another testimony of something I've seen in y'all's life. Um, you know, a lot of times people put their trust in the healing. So, people will say they'll associate their healing with God being good, and if they're not healed, then God's bad. But, what you kind of learn to do, I think, in your in your faith journey, wherever you are, is you learn to trust not in the healing, but in the healer. And, and so you trust God regardless if you're healed or not. We, we expect healing, and we ask God, and we beg God, but we still trust God, no matter what the outcome is. We trust Him because He's our Creator. And so I know that Mitzi and Mike have put their life in His hand, um, and they trust, trust the healer. So I... Um, I wasn't going to do this, but can we pray over them? Can we do that? Do you mind if we do that? What, can I? Does anybody want to just come up and pray over them with me? Just join me. It doesn't matter. Just anybody wants to come, we'll just pray over these guys. It's not planned, but I think it would be very appropriate. And we're we're very lucky to be members here. Amen. Uh, the people here have stepped up unbelievably. Amen. From our Sunday school class to everyone here, and we appreciate the help. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You good, Joel. Uh, Y'all, I'm Joel Shaw. I, I know you think I'm crazy. No, we don't. Go. But but all that all last night, all last night, I knew God was going to get me up here this morning, and I was like, God, how's that going to work? How's that going to work? And then. Katie does Romans 8, and then she does Jeremiah 29, 11, and everybody knows Jeremiah 29, 11, but whenever I do 29, 11, I make people focus on 12 and 13, because it's not just God has a plan for us, but God's got a plan that we got to go find, and we find it in the Bible, and we find it in prayer. 
So here's what I'm going to tell you. I am so grateful. I knew exactly what I was going to say. God gave me exactly what I was going to say. I am so grateful to this man right here, Justin. You know, most Methodist ministers were so programmed to that 60 minutes, oh, we got to get out on time, that he wouldn't be doing this. But Justin does this, and Justin gets people up here to do testimony. Justin has a doctorate degree. He's incredibly smart. I don't know about that. I, you're, incredibly, <laughs> you're incredibly smart, but you're actually a genius. You know when I figured out you were a genius? Justin gives the verse where God tells somebody to go slaughter the entire population to, to back a Joplin to preach on, and then he turns around and preaches on, he likes Chick-fil-A. <laughs> that man's a genius. That man's a genius. Let's pray for this. Let's pray for all of us. All of us have something in our heart and mind that we need prayer for. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you broken. We come to you broken and humble. But Lord, our trust is never in this body. It's never in this life. Lord, I don't care what the doctors say about her or about me. I know that that's just the body. But Lord, you can't hurt us. This, this earth can't hurt us. Death has no sting when we have your blood pumping through our veins. Because our life is about our spirit. And you have our spirit. And Romans 8 tells us that sometimes we just cry out, Abba, Father. I had said that just this morning before Katie talked about that. Praying that I went through a three-month period of time where all I could do was cry, I'm a father. My license plate is Romans 8. You gave that to me 24 years ago, Lord. I've been living it ever since. You gave me 29 of that, and I've been living it ever since. But, Lord, let's pray for Mitzi right, right now. Lord, we pray, number one, that you be glorified no matter what. Lord, even if this disease takes her body away, that you will see glory because how she walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But Lord, your scripture says you go through that valley. You don't stay in that valley. You don't die in that valley. You go through that valley. So Lord, I praise you for giving me these words last night. I didn't know how in the heck I'm going to be in front of this congregation praying these words you were giving me last night. Oh Lord, you're so faithful. You're so faithful. So, Lord, we pray, number one, that you be glorified no matter what. Number two, we pray that Mike and the family and all the friends have your peace and presence in a mighty and meaningful way, Lord, no matter what. They want their wife. They want their mother. They want their friend to live. We want her to live. She's got more things to say and more witnessing to do and more people to point toward you. Lord, there are people out here in a dark and cold and cruel world that are, that are struggling. And when they see a, a, a ray of light like this, it attracts them. It attracts them. It draws them in. That's why we're having a revival here at Bunkin Street, Lord, because your Holy Spirit is running wild. So, Lord, we pray, number three, that whatever treatments they're trying on her would work. She wants to live. Lord, I want to live. I've got so much to live for. I've got so many things to say and so many things to do. I want to live too. But Lord, if it's your plan to take us, we're ready. We'll go right now. We're ready right this second. You can check me out of here right now, and I'll trade this meat suit that's hanging on a rack of ribs in for something so much more glorious. That's all it is, Lord, is a meat suit that we're walking around in so people can see who we are. But ultimately, Lord, our prayer is that we would be so filled with your Holy Spirit that everyone would see Christ in us and that our eyes would be your eyes and we would see Christ in others, no matter what cover they are, no matter what, what um, denomination they are, no matter what class they are, no matter what nation they come from, that we see each other as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Lord... You laid the manna out in the desert. The manna out, all the people had to do was just wake up and bend down and pick it up and eat it. They didn't have to farm. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was wake up, walk out, bend down, and pick it up. You lay things in front of us every day, Lord. 
So help us now to pray together as your son taught us by saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. One final thing. Another thing God gave me this morning, I mean like a downloaded program on a high-speed internet, he gave me a message that I'm going to preach somewhere on Easter morning, I don't care if it's Main Street Greenville, how to, live, how to love like you were dying, based on the song, Live Like You Were Dying, how to love like you were dying, God gave me the whole sermon in five seconds. How to love like you were dying on Easter morning, because that's what Jesus did on Easter morning, on Good Friday. He loved like he was dying. And so somewhere, somehow, I'm preaching on Easter. And if y'all come, great. If you don't, I'm still preaching on Easter. <laughs> Amen, Joel. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you never know when church is going to break up. It happens from time to time. Um, maybe we'll do, maybe here's what we'll do this morning, uh, Daniel, if you're good with this. Um, we, we've been waiting to take up our offering after the sermon, uh, just as a way to give back. And we want to remind people that it's not about the money, but we want people to bring an offering of praise. So people to be able to respond, to come to the altar, to kneel, to pray, um, to bring themselves forward. So I think what we'll do this morning is we'll just have communion and the offering at the same time. Uh, so if that'll work, I don't think I'll throw anybody in logistical craziness. Um, if we'll just, just play our music, those um, that are going to collect the offering, if they'll come up and collect it uh, after communion is done. But um, here's what I want to tell you. As, uh, as we go into this time. You may have come here today, maybe that's the exact message that you need to hear is a message of faith. Um, maybe you need to be a Caleb. I think Mitzi is a Caleb. Uh, Mike is a Caleb. So maybe you know somebody who needs to hear this message and you just need to be encouraged. Um, but I want to encourage you and build you up and remind you that with God you can do all things. So if you came in here today and you feel afraid, feel scared, nervous, anxious, depressed, lonely, just remember that Jesus Christ is with you. If God brings you to it, what do we know? God will bring us through it, right? I want to remind you that we got people who will pray for you today. If you just want somebody to pray for you and pray for faith, I think that would be an awesome thing. Our prayer teams can just move into three. Um, and uh, so that's going to pray. So I just need more faith. Story in the Bible where a guy has a demon possessed son. Um, and he doesn't have the faith to trust that Jesus can heal him. And what does he cry out? Anybody remember? It's in Mark chapter 9. He cries out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. I do believe. Help my unbelief. The disciples prayed for more faith. So Jesus, give us more faith. And so I just ask you to pray and to ask you. And if we ask, we will receive. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus that you have given us each other, that you've given us the body of Christ, that you've given us um, the gift of Holy Communion that we share together to remember our brokenness and our unity in you. Um, as we pray over Mike and Mitzi today, we also pray for ourselves. We cry out, Jesus, that you'll bring healing to our areas of brokenness. That you'll pour out your grace on us. I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of bread and grape juice and make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Folks, this is the body of Jesus. It was broken for you. Take and eat. This is the blood of Jesus. It was poured out for you. Take and drink. If you're visiting today, I want to remind you that you can receive communion if you believe in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be baptized. We invite everybody at the table who earnestly repents of their sins.
follows Jesus. So let us receive, let's take our time, let us worship, and give God praise. Amen.